Okay, so this is a teensy bit random, maybe, but I've been hearing a lot about this topic lately, and you know, you're going to find this conversation to be familiar. It's been oddly relevant for the last year or two. Anyway, there's a well-known feng shui maxim that your living space and workspace should be clean, tidy, and clutter-free. Also, big, heavy bookcases and walls upon walls of books in a home is bad feng shui. As maxims that get passed down and onward through the generations, these are certainly true, but let's talk about the exceptions to the rules. I want to differentiate what I call creative chaos from the bad or atrophic kind of clutter. There are times when my home office is messy because there's three months worth of papers I no longer need, that I haven't gotten around to recycling, empty wrappers I haven't tossed, crumpled tissues, meaningless junk. I've been just too lazy to put away cobwebs and dust collecting everywhere. Heck, maybe there's even a dead bug on my windowsill to boot, or house plants that have been wilting from neglect. That's atrophic clutter. That's bad feng shui. But then there are these times when my home office is messy because I've got stacks of books for my active, ongoing research on a project I'm working on, journals and binders of notes that are presently relevant, clusters of crystals, recently acquired baubles, mementos, a vision board, magazine cutouts of my favorite things that I have, you know, yet to place onto my vision board, and colored highlighters rolling around everywhere. That's not necessarily bad or unwanted clutter. I call that creative chaos, and creative chaos is the primordial soup from which my projects, my ideas, my creativity, and best works manifest. I'm actually, whether I am conscious of it or not, whether you as a creative are conscious of it or not, we draw from the energetic imprints all of these objects give off, and that can help to fuel our inspiration. A simpatico relationship can happen here. And this is in no way to say you can't be creative in a clean, sanitized room. We've got to stop thinking in these limited ways of the binary. A clean, spotless, and sanitized workspace will give off a particular imprint of energy that, for a lot of people, will help them to keep their personal energies focused and channeled on their work. It can reduce the amount of energetic distraction, especially if your personality and character is prone to distraction. On the other hand, if your personality and character is one that is more empathic, where you're a sponge and you like being a sponge that absorbs all the goodness from the world around you and then you alchemize that into the work you produce, then a really clean, sanitized, spotless, and tidy room might actually be bad for you. And I always talk about this in feng shui consultations. These traditional, popular feng shui maxims that everyone knows are just a generic starting point, but it's not feng shui until you take into account the occupants. No feng shui master is going to not take into account the occupants. What's great feng shui for one person might be horrible, disempowering feng shui for another. So, not all clutter is bad. When clutter is creative chaos, it's a treasure trove of energy resources for the creative or artist to draw from. But when clutter is atrophic or causes energy atrophy, that's when clutter is bad feng shui and also bad for your productivity. How can you tell the difference? We start by understanding the metaphysical theory of animism. All of these objects in your space carry energy, and what that object signifies to you right now at this moment affects its energetic imprint and how that imprint will affect you. That's kind of the feng shui explanation of objects that spark joy, yada yada. You've heard that bit of advice before, right? I love that bit of advice for the common person because if you are a Shinto priestess with a deep connection to the spirit world and Joe Plummer, who is about as spiritual as a doornail, wants to know how to live a better life, 
maybe this Shinto priestess will simplify the concept and say, okay, okay, if it sparks joy. Now, let's say I'm now actually talking with an occultist, someone who is already by disposition a bit of an empath, some sort of practitioner of metaphysical arts. I don't need to talk at you like you're Joe Plummer. Even though the energetic imprint, the animistic character of these objects are independent from any judgments I may have of them, my feelings are important because my feelings help to reveal what chemistry is happening between my spirit and the object's spirit. So it's not about whether this object is inherently and objectively good feng shui or bad feng shui, though that assessment most certainly exists. It's that what matters more here when we're talking about the objects in my home and personal space is the chemistry between the object and me. In certain instances, like my relation to Mother Nature, like where to build a house or structure, you do want to yield to Mother Nature, so you're in harmony with Mother Nature. When you build stuff not in harmony with Mother Nature, look, at some point, Mother Nature is going to win. You're going to lose that war, plain and simple, so why fight? Always build and live in harmony with Mother Nature. Getting off topic here, my point is, when you are buying a house, choosing a place to live, yeah, that's when you need to find a building structure that yields to the land, rather than forcing the land to do what goes against that land's nature. But come on now, in terms of random objects on my office desk, eh, I can be more in control. I don't have to yield. If you care to get into the chemistry of feng shui, each object is either predominantly yin or predominantly yang, and then beyond that, at present, occupies one of the five changing phases, wood, fire, earth, metal, water, and that will interact with your particular metaphysical energetic composition and disposition in particular ways, which a feng shui master would know all about via birth chart, face reading, palm reading, divination, chatting it up with your ancestors, or whatnot. But we're getting too complicated here. Let's just keep it simple. Considering an object's condition, its energy is A, positive, B, a trophic, kind of bad, or C, results in poison arrows, really bad. Anything rotting in a state of decay causes you to enter a state of inertia, or what you would consider waste is C, poison, and that really bad, and that get rid of it now. Anything that sparks joy is A, positive. Easy, right? That's because you're utilizing your intuition. You can intuit the science. So the feng shui master is someone who studies the science of it all and can explain in technical or metaphysically technical terms why things are the way they are. But I genuinely believe you can intuit feng shui too. You just know when something is off and you just know when everything is on point. The science helps you to immediately spot what's wrong, so that's why some people want to study the science, right? Now let's talk about books. Heavy bookcases lined wall to wall with books. Why is this considered bad feng shui? Asians are all about education and scholarship, so why would Asian feng shui masters say that bookcases and walls upon walls of books would be bad? Feng shui is, whether Westerners want to admit it or not, is premised on animism. You start with the fundamental belief that there's some sort of sentience to objects. Once upon a time, sure, we talked about spirits, but I think today a better way of expressing the concept is as an unseen metaphysical counterpart to the physical measurable counterpart that you can see, touch, and physically experience. In the same way, books as material objects have certain chemical and physical properties, they have alchemical and metaphysical spiritual properties. This might sound crazy to some of you occult practitioners out there, 
but conceptualize every single book on your bookshelf as a sigil. Yeah, that's right. This is a sigil. And this is a sigil too. They're all powerful sigils, at least in a manner of speaking. It's just to help conceptualize what I'm trying to explain. The level of concentrated, intense energy that needs to be channeled, the cone of power produced by many sharing the same objective required to produce something like this, does, whether its creators realize it or not, result in, well, sigil magic. It's, well, roughly speaking, here's the thing. To the seasoned practitioner, now that I have explained that a wall of books is basically a wall of like a hundred very different sigils, each one emanating its particular signature of power and energetic imprint, the feng shui maxim kind of makes more sense, right? Everything gives off a life essence, which in animistic theory, you might express as spirits. Wall-to-wall -wall bookcases filled with books, assuming you buy into the description that it's like a bunch of powerful sigils, each with a unique and very different yet distinct energy imprint, having its unseen impact on you and your space can be either a good or bad thing. It's energetically a bad thing if your objective is empty mind, clear mind, and total serenity. If you want the feng shui or qi life force in your room to be clean, clear, unfettered, then lots of books is energetically bad, as in that's not in line with your own objectives. But if having all that creative chaos around you, that diverse sigil magic wall-to-wall -wall of books creates, is exactly what you want to be able to draw from on the chi energy level, then yeah, absolutely, books are awesome because they are in line with your specific objectives. And that's usually going to be the writers, the artists, the creatives, philosophers, and academics among us who most benefit from the feng shui of bookcases because on some unconscious animistic spiritual level, they are drawing from the energies of those books, the treasure trove of ideas and inspiration they've surrounded themselves with. So in feng shui, Clutter is only bad when it energetically blocks or hinders your own goals and objectives, but clutter is good if it's creative chaos, the primordial soup of energy you are pulling from for intellectual productivity. Okay, that's all I wanted to jump on here to talk about.